Hello, good day, and welcome back. And today, I'm going to continue with fiber application configuration. The video is going to focus specifically on this one configuration parameter called immutable. It's a Boolean value. The default is false. And I'll show you what the implications are when it's the default and why you should know about this parameter. And the reason I did not cover it in our previous video when I was talking about configuration is because it's so important. I wanted to dedicate an entire video to it so I can illustrate the problem. So let's jump in. So one of the things about fiber is that it's really fast. And part of the reason that it's really fast, not because it's using a really fast router, HTTP router, part of that speed comes from the decision around how memory is used. And so you can imagine that if you're going to write something like a web application that needs to handle a ton of requests, that you are going to be allocating values possibly on the heap, or even if you're growing your stack, well, you know, you have to tear it down and so on. So that can slow down the application, especially if it's stuff you're allocating in a heap because you're going to be putting some pressure on the garbage collector. And don't forget, Go is a garbage collected language. So if you can make the decision or give the user the choice of saying, hey, if you want to go really, really fast, guess what? We don't allocate any memory. We do zero allocation. But if this is not going to work for you or you have concerns, then you can set a flag that let us know that oh, you want us to allocate memory. So this is probably not going to make any sense right now. But I just wanted to set up the lay of the land before we jump in. So let's jump to our command line. And we're going to start off by writing a very simple application. And we're going to start with copying our previous example from example two, and then we're going to go from there. So once we have example two copy it as example three, and we change to that directory, we're going to start our editor. So one of the things I want to do is use some features from Golang version 1.21. So if you don't have that version installed, um, Definitely, it's available. So, what is nice about it? Well, I use I like using um, structured login, and usually I use that from the Charm bracelet um, repo. But Go version one that two one has structured login package on the log, and it's called S log. So, I'll just switch to that. Okay. So now let's modify our application. Okay, so the only thing I want to do now is change the route that we have. And so instead of being slash, I'm going to put colon name. Now, we haven't talked about routing and the different ways you can do routing. So just trust me and go with this for now until we revisit routes. So what this means is that colon name can be set to different values. And so what I'm going to do is log that, retrieve it from the fiber context, and give it the name n, store it in the variable n, and then I'm going to use structural login to log it out. And then if we run our application, did a request for slash, it said that there was no handler. That's because our handler was specifically slash and then some name. It required that name. It's just that the name was dynamic. And you can see I make a request here for foo and go, and you can see that oh, it, I can print it out in the log. Okay. So now let's read what it says here. So it says when you use um, param method on the context, that it returns a value. And notice the value returning there is a string. However, they say that this value is only good while you're within your handler. It says do not store any reference to this value. And certainly, if you want to do that, then you should um, not use it outside of your handler. So once your handler returns, this value is no longer valid. And so you may be thinking, well, strings in Go are immutable. So if they're returning a string, how are they able to change it from under me? And to that, I say, that, oh, this is where that zero allocation and so on come in. So you definitely want to heed this um, warning. So let me do something here. I'm going to create a constant with the letters A through Z. The reason I'm doing this is basically what I want is to pretend that I'm going to have some long running thing that gets kicked off um, some work that I need to do after I, a request handler is called. So you can imagine that you get a request to do something 
and you want to return very quickly, but you're going to pass on the extra work for that request to some long-running function. So a Go routine would be an example of something that you could just kick off to do this work. Now, with this example that I'm doing, I want to be able to show that while the Go routine is still running and we return from our handler, that once we are referencing this value that we get from params, that it's changing from under us. So what I'm going to do is write a function called get handler ID. The way to understand this is every time we get a request, our Go routine ID is going to look something like this, or we're going to create a Go routine ID that looks something like this. The first request is going to be, you know, GR ID 1, 8, blah, blah, blah. Now, I could use 0, but notice on line 17, I increment my index before I use it in line 18. So that's why it's it's not zero based. And the reason for that is I didn't want us to think too much about zero being mapped to A and all this other stuff. So that's why. All right. So if you buy that or I could generate a request ID for each time I get a request, now it's just a matter of using it. So already on line 22, I'm getting the name from that context, right? The param params value for that name parameter. So let's do this. Let's create another variable called concurrent ID, um, you know, very creative here. And this is where I'm going to get an ID, a handler ID from my function. Then I'm going to spin up a Go routine, anonymous Go routine, by the way. And later on, we'll see it, it doesn't matter if it's a name function, like you still have the same problem. So I spin up an anonymous Go routine, and I'm going to print out some log message, basically saying that, oh, we're going to print out that we're starting to do some work, basically by saying that our handler is starting. And of course, our handler has an ID, which is this concurrent ID. Remember, we get that from our function that's generating um, those ID, right? Those handler ID. And then we're going to print out the value for n. Notice n is the string that we get from Fiverr context on line 24. All right. So... What I want to do is my Go routine for run for like 10 seconds. So I'm going to do time that after to get a channel which I can wait for, you know, 10 seconds to expire. And then um, once that happens, I'm going to print out a message saying basically that my handler is finished. You know, I'm going to again, I'm going to print out what my ID is for my Go routine and what the value of N is. Now, if N change by the end when I'm ready to print out that I'm finished, I should have a different value. So within that 10 seconds, so my timer is not up, I want to be able to print out that my handler is still running. So I'm just going to write out this message, handler running. And again, write out my ID and the current value of N. And then, of course, if I were to do it like this, I would be printing out a lot of messages. And we don't want to pull to screw a lot of messages, so I'll put a little delay. So I'll sleep for one second. Now, normally, if you look at a score, you'd expect that nothing would change, right? N is not supposed to change. Um, again, because N is supposed to be immutable string, and it's just a string. It's not pointed to a string. It's just a string. Now, the last thing to do here is just make sure that I have matching braces and everything is good. So that's it. It's very simple. So if we should pause and review this, we'll see that I kick off a Go routine, and because I kick off a Go routine, this function is my handler is going to return immediately. But remember, because I pass the n, which is what I got from the fiber context on line 24 string that's stored in that n variable into this Go routine, now I have something else that is referencing this value long after my handler return. Okay, so now let's go make a few calls. So what I'm going to do, I showed before that if I call my um, send these restful endpoints with a string after slash that I can print it out. So we'll just make a few calls. And one reason I'm calling it like this is because of way, the way I generate my request ID. We can easily see that the name I pass should match up with what's in the ID for the Go routine that's handling this request. And so if we look at um, the last line there now, we can see it all the last request we made was H, and so that's done. But if we start going back up our list, we're going to notice some really strange things. So, for example, if we look here at this line, we'll see that the handler that was supposed to be handling E, right, it, the name value 
is F. When did that happen? So somewhere along the line, things change. And if we go back up to the top and we sort of scroll down, here, we had, everything was good, where the handler with the IDE was handling, um, was doing some work with the value being E. But then if you look at this example. Here we see the handler that was handling with the, we see the handler for C, its value was changed to E at some point. And another example is the handler B, its value was changed to D. So to better see what's going on, what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy all the output from my program here. I'm going to paste it into a text file, and let's just call it output.txt. And what is allow me, this is going to allow me to do is do some processing on it. So for example, I can say cat, whatever the output of that file is, but oh, I need to be in the correct directory. So let's say here, I will say cat the output. So nothing different is exactly what I have in that file. But then I can grip for certain things. And so I want to grip for each line that has um, information about what was running or what finished, right? And so if you look at the output, everything looked pretty much the same because um, I want to get rid of any time value. And so everything looked pretty much the same except for the time. So I want to get rid of that. So I can tell grip to just output stuff from the info on towards the end. And then I can pass it to sort. Um, and so I can pass it to sort, which would sort everything. And so it basically group the things that are similar. Then I could say sort minus u, which filter out things that are alike. So when you have the unique ones. And so now we can see that as we go through it, we can see that when the, my, by the time my handlers were finished, the name value had changed for many of the handlers. Or the, and the value that the handlers were using, the name variable that the handlers were using. Essentially, what this tells you is that the value in the name variable or the n variable had changed while the handler was still doing work, right? Because by the time it was done, the value was different. And you can see if we look at starting, when we started, it was correct. They all match up. It's only when by the time it's finished, it was different. And we can also see that while it was running, it changed. So we can see for the handler B, its value for name changed from B to D. And then for C, it was the worst. It actually changed from C to E and then to F. What this tells us is that it changed twice. So this is just a simple example of showing you exactly why you need to understand this and be careful. So it's only safe to use those values within the context of your handler. But once you return, you're essentially saying, oh, I'm done. You can do whatever you want with this underlying storage. And so that's why this is changing. So let's take a look at another example before I show you the solution. So in example two, we're going to do something a little different. But what if we have to call it to some function that we don't control? So this example is meant to simulate that. So let's just say the go routine, we remove it from our handler. And instead, we're going to call a function called do stuff. Maybe it's you know a function that's provided by some other team mate or something, somebody else on our team. It's existed before. You don't know. And so you don't know the details of what that function is doing. And so, so you're going to call this function do stuff. And it's written by someone else. And so let's imagine that that person, they now um, take the value that you give them, which again is just a string, and everybody thinks that strings are immutable in Go. So they don't know anything about the fact that the storage that's back in the string can change. And so they now spin up like a Go routine to use that value. And so it is not you who actually calls something that explicitly did it, right? It's indirect. So you're going to run into the same problem as I will show you here again. So let's do make some calls and we'll try and do this as quickly as possible. So again, I'm going to, so we'll make a call is true K, let's say. And so once our K handler, the last one is finished, We'll go back and we'll do the same thing. We'll copy the output, our log output, and we'll again paste it in our file. I don't care to keep the old one, so I'll just select everything and paste the new content of the existing one. And if I rerun my sort and all this other stuff, you can see the same thing. And you can see that he, even here, 
we see the problem. Like not even when it started, it got the right angle. And the reason why this happened is most likely because now we have to do a function call. It took the, the go routine some time to start up. So by the time they're ready to start, the value already changed. So this is even worse than before. But again, we, we could have seen the same thing in the previous one. It's just we only run one test, to be honest. So we could have probably seen the same issue if we had run it multiple times. But if you look here, you can see that we've seen the same thing where for some of our handler, their value changed multiple times. So for example, so we can see that under F value was just screwed up even from the beginning. It started with the wrong value and even while it was running, its um, value was changed twice. So how do we fix this? For configuration, we can set this field called immutable and it's a Boolean and it says when set to true, this relinquishes the zero allocation promise in certain cases, I'm gonna get back to the certain cases, in order to access the handler value. So this means that if immutable is set to true, it means that your request value, you're gonna have um, value returned to you that shouldn't change. Remember, it said in certain cases, keep that in mind. So with that said, we don't have to do anything else. We just set our immutable on the fiber application configuration and we run it. And notice that params method for the context also tell you the same thing that if you want the value to be immutable then you should change the configuration for the fiber application okay so now let's run our application because again that's the only thing we really need to do and we can run our application we can rerun it and see what happens so we already have things running so let's so let's change to our example three directory um, kick things off, clean up, and then we're going to once again run, send some requests in from A through K. So now we just have to wait until our K handler exits, because that was the last one that was spun up, so it's going to finish last. And each handler runs for like 10 seconds, and we see that. So now let's just copy the output, log output. Uh, let's do some processing to see if we still have the issue. So again, we go back to our output.log file, copy everything, paste the new thing, the new content over it. And now let's um, run our grep and sort command and let's see what's going on. So when it's done, we can see that all the handlers still had the same value for the name variable when they completed, which means that it, was, it would never change while they were running. And we can see that, that when it was running, we only have one line showing that oh, it never changed to anything other than this. This is why the sort and the minus u took out the duplicates and all this other stuff. So that's basically all that was doing to make it easier for us to be able to summarize things in this way. So what's the takeaway? The takeaway is that you should be aware of these sort of things for packages or thing, anything that you use. And I think this is so important to know that I wanted to dedicate one video to just illustrating the problem and give you my opinion. In my opinion, I would say though it's not worth it to worry about speed and performance. I think it's good that they wrote it that way, but I don't think when you develop, you should be um, thinking about performance immediately. If you happen to develop an application that needs to worry about performance, that's a good problem to have. Before I go, please, if you can help out the channel, please do, which means that oh, if you're going to buy anything Tesla related, I have a Tesla referral link. If you know anyone who even wants to do test drive, they can use my Tesla referral link. You don't even have to buy something. You could just want to do a test drive. I have my Patreon page there. Um, if you are able to contribute that way. Um, other than that, take care and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.